The scripture for this service is Revelation chapter one verses nineteen to chapter two verse seven. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have, you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have things. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Senior Pastor will deliver a message under the title of the Lecture on Revelation. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, and the members around the world, and those who are attending this service through the internet and GCN viewers. The seven churches represent all the churches that are built in the name of the Lord. Therefore, the word that the Lord gave to the seven churches becomes a standard to judge all the churches on the judgment day. Before the Lord gave such an important word, He said in Revelation 1, verses 19 and 20, "Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are." And the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. He said to John, "The things which you have seen." Uh, they refer to the things that John saw in his vision, that is, the contents of the first chapter. And particularly, since John was seeing the appearance of the Lord, the things which you, uh, which is John, have seen, were specifically the things about the Lord Jesus Christ. John was one of Jesus' disciples. He saw many things while he was with the Lord for three years. All the things that he saw, heard, and learned were the things which you have seen, and because of this, he could write about the Lord much better. The things which are refer to the words that the Lord was about to give to the seven churches. But in a broader sense, the things which are also refer to the things. Which have happened since the Lord ascended into heaven till now, and why is that? The words for the seven churches in chapter two and chapter three of the Revelation are not not only for the seven churches that existed in those days, but also for the churches that have existed, and for the churches that will have been built until the Lord comes back. Therefore, the things which are applied to all the churches that have existed throughout the generations, and to the churches that exist now. Lastly, the things which will take place refer to the things that haven't happened yet, but will surely happen. Such as the second advent of the Lord, the seven-year great tribulation, the millennium kingdom, the white throne judgment, and separating the souls who will go to the heaven from those who will fall into hell. In other words, they refer to the things written in Revelation from chapter four to chapter twenty-two. 
The Lord was showing to John in advance the things which will take place and telling him to write them. And he explained what the seven stars and the seven churches mean. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, in other words, the servants who minister the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Then the Lord said, The seven stars and the seven lampstands are in the right hand of the Lord. I told you that it means the churches and the servants that the Lord is holding are held by His power. God holds in His hand of power God's churches and the servants that are proper before God. It is such a church and such a servant that God searches for. And through them, God proclaims His will and He receives glory. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there are many churches and servants in this world. But only those churches and servants that the Lord Himself holds in His hand are the true churches and the true servants of the Lord. And the churches and the servants that the Lord holds in His hands are with the Lord Himself. Therefore, judging and condemning these churches and servants is judging and condemning the Lord. Moreover, The teaching from the lips of the servant that the Lord holds is the word of God and the truth, and it becomes the standard of justice. God makes His servant that God guarantees proclaim the will of God clearly so that the word through such a servant will become a standard of judgment on the last day. There are countless churches in the world, and there are countless servants who preach the Word of God. But what they teach is not always the truth. Only the Word that is proclaimed through the servant that God recognizes and guarantees can be true. And it is the true will of God and the correct standard of the judgment. Also, not all the churches take place take the duty as an ark of salvation. Only the churches that the Lord is holding and the churches that God remains with can play the role of an ark of salvation in these last days. There are many churches that are built in the name of the Lord outwardly, but there are actually many churches that the Lord's presence cannot be with. Therefore, on the last judgment day, How you live the Christian life on this earth would become a standard for your individual judgment. And at the same time, what church you belong to will become another standard as well. Of course, the salvation is decided based upon the relation between God and you. However, What church a Christian belongs to, how he managed his Christian life in that church, and as what kind of a servant he served God, will all have a great impact on his faith. For example, someone didn't know about the truth yet, and he heard the servant of God in his church judged or condemned another church or another servant of God. then he himself might also judge and condemn without him you know, already, without you know, realizing it. Even though he didn't do so with some sort of evil intention in his heart, his deed cannot be overlooked on the final day of judgment. Even though he didn't have any evil intention, he is evil to God. God surely tells people in the Bible not to judge, not to condemn, not to gossip others. The Bible says God searches the heart of people. Can he say he didn't know that? Even though God speaks, he disobeyed and he ignored the word of God, didn't he? He cannot judge or condemn others just by listening to the words of others. God tells us to love even enemies, but He hates, he hates and tries to destroy someone who is not an enemy to Him. How can He be not considered evil?
악담을 한다면 그것이 어찌 악하다 하지 않겠습니까? If he had been a man of goodness, he would, have, he would not have judged or condemned through what he personally saw or heard. Even if he had done so when he was a novice Christian and did not know the truth well, he still might have realized his sin and repented of it. While managing his Christian life, he could have learned the truth and he could have realized what he said and did in the past was so evil. If he had repented of it even then, he might have been okay. okay? But if he stands before the white throne in the last judgment day without repenting of it, his deeds that he committed cannot be overlooked just by saying, I did it because I didn't know the truth. You know that there are two kinds of sins. One is a sin that leads you to death, and the other that doesn't lead you to death. They are found, they are found in both Old and, Old and New Testaments. I've told you over and over again that you shouldn't commit a sin that leads you to death. What are the sins leading to death? I've taught you from the Bible, and I've told you not to commit such a sin. Now, is the sin that doesn't lead you to death not judged on the judgment day? Well, you will surely be judged. So how can you avoid the judgment? You will not be judged for the sins that you repented and turned back from. If you repent, God will not remember the sin, just as the east is far from the west. But if you don't repent, you will be surely judged on the last day. To those who commit sins again and again, I keep telling them to repent and turn back. Yet, I still find people who don't repent but keep committing the same sin. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, even trivial word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. Jesus said, I mean, the one who commits sin will surely give an accounting for what he did. Therefore, you must realize how important it is to, how important it is, you know, what kind of church you belong to and what kind of servant of God you serve in this world. Even when you commit sin, if you are not pointed and if you are not rebuked, what will happen to you on the last judgment day? You will give an accounting for the sin you commit. According to your choice, your soul may prosper and you may advance to a better dwelling place in heaven. Or in, on the contrary, you may be led by a blind man and fall into a pit. So brothers and sisters, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 says, Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Of course, faith is a matter of an individual, and you will be judged individually in the last judgment day. But there is something similar to a team game, and team gain the score in faith. So what I mean is, Basically, in what church you live your believing life in and who was the servant of God in your church would become the standard of your individual judgment. In the last judgment day, uh, there is not only a judgment of an individual but also a judgment of a church. Depending on what kind of judgment your church gets, it can be a benefit to you or maybe of no benefit. If the church is built in the name of the Lord, there must be judgment according to the word. And the words that are given to the seven churches will become the standard of the judgment. Also, if a servant was in charge of the church, he will be judged not only according to his individual faith, but also according to his role as a shepherd of the church. Depending on how he managed the church and the congregation entrusted to him in the name of the Lord, there will be very strict judgment. 
He should have managed the church and the congregation according to the will of the Lord as a shepherd of the church that was built in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he didn't, it wouldn't be easy for him to stand in the judgment. Furthermore, if the church built in the name of Jesus Christ hindered the glory of God and did falsely, the church will be surely be judged according to justice. The judgment will not be easy or lose. The judgment will be very precise and correct according to the word of God. So you shouldn't live a loose Christian life. You remember the Old and New Testament. Everything will be paid back. Not even a piece from your lips will fall to the ground. They will be judged if you ignore this fact. It means you neglected God, right? You blaspheming God. Some people speak up as if they spoke in the name of the Lord and God and as if they spoke for God. If it becomes more serious, they will be captive to Satan and they will speak lies easily. If they do something by the word of God, there must be evidences. There must be evidences that God is with them and that God guarantees them. They cannot say God gives them revelations without being able to show the evidences. There must be evidences others can trust. In James chapter 3, verse 1, Apostle Paul said, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. If you want to become a teacher, you must be the right one. You must become a teacher or a pastor who is able to lead your people to the green pastures and the quiet waters. If you are still in the flesh, if you still love the world and follow the world, how can you tell your people to live by the word of God and to pray? And how can you expect them to listen to you? Jesus said in Matthew 18, 6, But whoever causes one of, the, one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it will be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. If a servant becomes in charge of a church and leads many souls to the path of destruction, how severe a punishment should be sentenced in the judgment. On the other hand, if a servant who is in charge of a church leads the congregation to green pasture and quiet waters and eventually to heaven, he will be rewarded with amazing and wonderful prizes and glory. Such many meanings are contained in the word as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Now, let's take a look at the words given to the seven churches. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the words given to the seven churches, the information about what kind of church is commanded by the Lord and what kind of church is rebuked, summarizing the word in the Old and New Testaments. And if you listen to these words, you will understand what category your church falls into. The words given to the seven churches can also be a guidebook for a life of faith, which is necessary to check the status of individuals' faith and to make their faith stand still. They help you check whether you are living a right Christian life, whether you teach your people well and lead well, and whether you are eating the right thing while you know, living a right Christian life. Even though God clearly presents how your church can become a church that can be commanded through the words for the seven churches. However, depending on what path you choose, the result will be very different. Therefore,
I hope that you will listen to the upcoming messages and make it your bread of life. Please, look back on yourself to see whether you have something that the Lord rebuked you for. And if there is something, please return from it right away. And live by the word so that this opportunity can become a blessing to stand with your faith on a rock. Also, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that all the churches and the servants of God who listen to this message may realize there will be judgment of the churches and the servants on the last day so that they can be changed into the churches and the servants that the Lord will command. If a servant of God doesn't teach the flock well so that the flock stumble and lose grace and faith, don't you think the servant will be judged on the last judgment day? You must lead your life as a servant of God or a church worker with fear for God. By all means, you must help your flock's soul prosper, be full of faith, full of faith, life, and Holy Spirit, so that they can take heaven by force. You must become a servant of God who is good enough to lead them to green pastures and quiet waters. Look at the members of Mammon Church. They say, if they had not come to the church, they would have divorced. My family would have been destroyed. I have committed a suicide. So many people are saying like that. Since they came to this church of life, they changed, they were healed, they were evangelized, they became happy family, happy husbands and wives. You got to become a servant or workers who can lead your souls to green pastures and quiet waters. The Word of God is so strong that it can penetrate spirit and soul and every joint and marrow, right? You must change them so that they can have hope for New Jerusalem and take it by force. Don't you think? Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you look into Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. Here, the angel of the church in Ephesus refers to the shepherd who is in charge of the church in Ephesus. And it is the Lord who wrote to the angel of the church in Ephesus. And it describes, uh, it describes the Lord as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. As I told you earlier, it means the churches and the servants that are built in the name of the Lord and the Lord himself holds will be the standard of precise justice. Therefore, when judgment is made of the churches, that are taught to be built in the name of the Lord and of the things that are taught to be done in the name of the Lord. The churches and the servants that the Lord himself built and guaranteed will become the standard of the judgment. In some, the seven churches that are held in the right hand of the Lord are the churches that are proper before the Lord among the churches from the early churches to the church the churches that will build to, that will have been built until the Lord comes back again. Such churches live by the word of God so that they are always full of the Holy Spirit and love and there are the works of God present with them. All the churches that have existed on this earth should be such churches. And the servants of God who are in charge of the churches must be held in the right hand of the Lord. They must become a servant 
that is worthy to be supervised and guided by Father God. When the servant becomes the one that God recognizes like this, God Himself guarantees him. And you must understand that if you gossip, judge, or condemn such a servant, it means you do the things to the Lord. Now, the scripture says, the Lord walks among the seven golden lampstands. The seven golden lampstands are the seven churches, and the candles in the lampstands are the congregation. Just as the light of the candles illuminate the darkness, when a church, which is the uh, which is comprised of God, uh, which is comprised of God believing people, is full of the Holy Spirit and lives in the church, the church starts to shine in its light. So, if a man has true faith, he will live in the light according to the Word of God. Through a church that consists of such people, countless people can come out of the darkness and reach salvation. In order to find such a church, the Lord walks among all the churches with His fiery eyes. So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, since the words that are given to the seven churches are the words that apply to all the churches that have existed on this earth, transcending space and time, so we can find a church in these days that represents the seven churches. Among the churches that exist today, what church is a model church that represents the church in Ephesus? When I explain the scripture from now on, please try to discern in the truth about what kind of church falls into a category that is like the church in Ephesus. However, don't judge by saying, Oh, that church. But please, look back on your church too to see whether your church has the aspect that the church in Ephesus had or whether you personally have such an aspect in you and make this time full of grace. Now, the Lord gives the church in Ephesus a word of commendation. In verses 2 and 3, He said, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. Not tolerating evil men. Mamin church should become like that, but it doesn't do well. There are people who disobey. You know, there are, there are people who disobey the word of God, stopping the revival of this church. I told you that we got to build the Canaan centuries, so we shouldn't have any wall of sin before God. But they go after their benefit, and they make troubles within this church, which I feel sorry for. There shouldn't be no wall of sin from now on. Before we go to Canaan sanctuary, we should not be interfered by Satan. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. First, he said, the church in Ephesus showed its toil and perseverance in order to walk in the truth. The shepherd and the congregation of the church in Ephesus cast away the things that were against the truth one by one, and they tried to live in the word of God. What about you? Are you living the way they live their Christian lives? There are four categories in the word of God. Do's and don'ts and keeps and throwaways. If you read the Old and New Testament, you can find many do's. Preach the gospel, pray, and so on. So you do what the Bible tells you to do. The Bible also lists many things that you shouldn't do. Don't steal, don't be adulterous, do not hate, don't judge. Do not be jealous. Do not gossip. Then you should not do what the Bible tells you not to do. It is so easy. 
it's never difficult to live by the word of God. You do what God tells you to do, and you don't do what God tells you not to do. And what about keeps? Keep the commandments, keep the Lord's day holy. How easy. When you drive, if you are of goodness, you will uh, keep the traffic regulations as you learned. How good it is if you keep them. You don't need to read the face of a police officer. You don't need to look around whether there is a surveillance camera. The accident doesn't happen all the time, but it's serious when you once got involved in one. So you must drive safely, and you got to keep the traffic laws. Since you don't keep them, you make a mistake, and you encounter a car accident. If you keep the word of God as you keep the law of your country, I told you to keep the law, no matter how insignificant they may seem. You will be in trouble with the trivial thing that you overlooked before. You cast off and throw away what God tells you to throw away. God tells you to throw them away because you have to. You cast off sin to the point of shedding blood. As written in Hebrews, you cast off every form of evil. How good is it if you throw them away? How good? If you keep the words like this, you will eventually come into spirit, resemble the Lord, and get love from God. You hear, your, you hear God saying, My dear son, my dear daughter. When you cast off everything, when you keep what you should keep, and when you do what you're supposed to do, then you can hear God saying, My dear son. There are four categories in the Word of God, and the words that fall into these categories are found everywhere in the Bible. But, in order to live by this word of the truth, you need your toil and perseverance. Hebrews 12, 4 says, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. In other words, the Bible clearly tells us to resist to the point of shedding blood in your striving against the sin. Some pastors, I always worry about them. There are such pastors, elders, and workers that I always worry about. And the Holy Spirit mourns for them. And they say they are loved by the senior pastor. So I'm telling you, don't be deceived by them. Only the word of God and the Lord. You've got to believe in them, the word of God only. And don't be deceived by anybody. And do not believe those who use the senior pastor's name in false. They use my name to do something, like in you know, collecting money or do something. They pretend as if they love God and they were loved by God. They were recognized by God. But don't believe them. It happened in the past, 1998 and 1999. People around me know how much I worry about them. But they say, you know, they pretend as if they were loved by a senior pastor. So I told you, don't be deceived by them. Don't believe them. Don't believe anybody except the Lord and God. Don't listen to those who say, I love senior pastor so much. He loves me so much. Okay? Even if he is the head of this church, don't believe, head of uh, the, some group, don't, be, don't believe them. But you believed them, and you trusted them, and you were deceived by them. It said, it, the same happens again. You have no idea when they are going to change for their benefit. 
while they are coming into you know, spirit diligently, they look at the world instantly. So, as long as they got flesh, there is a chance that they will be deceived by the flesh and go to the flesh. The Bible clearly tells us to resist to the point of blood, to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. And Revelation 2.10 says, Be faithful until death. Likewise, in order to cast away sin and evil in the heart to the point of shedding blood and to be faithful to the given duties, toil surely follows as well as perseverance. Then, did you toil and did you persevere in order to throw away your sin and to be faithful to your given duty to the point of receiving the commendation of the Lord like the church in Ephesus? You should not say, I've done this much and feel satisfied. Just as the 1 Corinthians 10, 18 says, For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. You must become the one who is approved and commended by the Lord. I don't mean that you have to cast away sin and, sin and be faithful just to receive the Lord's commendation. You must become an unworthy servant who can say, I only did what I had to do, even after you've accomplished the commission given by the Lord. I revived this church. Well, Father God worked. Thanks to the work of the Lord, thanks to the fervor of all the congregation, their evangelization and prayer, all things worked for the revival. But some say, I did this. Some say, well, we used to have many in the congregation, but, you know, now it came back to normal. Some people didn't say it like that. You gotta have the heart of an unworthy steward. Then you can become a church and congregation who can truly be commended by the Lord. Since the church in Ephesus toiled and persevered in order to walk in the truth, the Lord said to the church in Ephesus, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance. And He commanded their toil and perseverance. Second, the Lord commanded the church in Ephesus for not tolerating evil men. Some people misunderstand the truth and say, a church is a place where love is practiced. So, even when someone commits sin, isn't it true that the one should be tolerated? Well, however, the parents with true love do not unconditionally forgive and tolerate their children even when they commit sin. They rather try to correct them even by spanking them. And the same applies. The same applies in the Lord. Of course, we got to forgive others 70 times, 7 times. And we have to endure with patience so that others can be changed by the truth in the Lord. But it does not mean that we have to sit back and watch even though we know that others go to the way of death. Jesus said in Matthew 18 verses 15 to 17, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if it does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. This church should also do this. When someone disobeys the word of God, we gotta advise them. If they, they listen, then we gotta take one or two more. 
and then it should be reported to the church if he doesn't listen, not unconditionally. We gotta privately, you know, advise, and or we gotta look for uh, two or three in a higher position. And if he doesn't listen, then we gotta report it to the church, and we gotta elders meeting. And they should be reported, and they gotta correct what is wrong. They gotta correct what has been wrong. Otherwise, it will decay. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. We must cover the transgression of others, forgive and tolerate them. But if they don't change till the end, and if they don't even listen to the church, Jesus tells us to treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector. It's not because we don't have love or mercy. It's because they may influence others and have a negative influence on the whole church if tolerated. Look at our students. I was surprised. A student came to me to repent. The student is one of those students who gave special praises on the altar many times. He led many student events in the church, such as in the praise and worship services. But I was surprised. I was surprised to see him. He came to me to repent. He said he played games with his cell phone during the worship service, such as in the second half of Friday online service. You know, I heard. You can now watch movies through your cell phone. You can play game with your cell phone. Is it true? I thought you know, <laughs> cell phones are only to make phone calls. But now you can play games, and you can watch movies. Is it true? Well. I'm glad he came to repent. How can such a good student become like that? Students learn from other students, don't they? If someone starts to do something, it'll end up all other students do the same. It spreads like that. All the students should do the deeds of the truth, but they actually fall in evil things. When someone does a bad thing, it will be uh, learned by others, and they all go to the way of death and destruction together. They should worship God in spirit and truth, but instead, they play with their cell phones and they send and receive text messages. Are they truly Christians? It is that they don't believe and that they spit on the face of God. They are far from salvation. Likewise, the church in Ephesus didn't tolerate the evil man, and the Lord commanded for that. But then, the church in Ephesus heard the rebuke from the Lord later. And why, uh, why is that? I'll explain on this in the next lecture. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. This is the word of God. But not for this reason. There is another clear reason that we must be holy. God sent His one and only Son, to redeem us from our sin. And Jesus showed his love to us to the point of becoming an atoning sacrifice for us. And he was set crucified on the cross. The Lord sent the Holy Spirit to us, and the Holy Spirit intercedes for the souls with groaning too deep for words. And he leads us to the righteousness and the truth. If you know such love of God, the Trinity, you must not live in the darkness any longer. Also, 
The church that consists of God's children must be in the holiness of the truth. Therefore, a church as a body of Christ must not tolerate evil. But if we look into the reality of today, we can find that even through that even though there is evil revealed in the church, the church doesn't rebuke it or get rid of it, but ignores it and tolerates it. The church worries whether a member might leave the church if he has to receive rebuke or admonishment. That it, you know, they may worry that it may cause a problem for the revival of the church, or the church tolerates sin because it compromises with wealth and authority. But what is the role of a church? It is to teach the children of God not to dwell in sin any longer, get out of the darkness, and to live in the truth. Uh, there was a man and woman who came to me to inform me that they would get married. They went out for six years, and they got the uh, marriage date, and he, they came to me to receive my prayer for their marriage. They look so clean and pure. For six years, they haven't done any fleshly thing to each other. They truly loved each other. Sometimes, you know, they met once a month while they've been faithful to Father God's kingdom. And the lady asked me a question, and I said, what? Well, I'm telling you this because it will help you. She said, Senior Pastor, you said the Christians should marry, but it is, well, it's not my word, okay? It is the word of God. Read the Bible. The God tells us to read, to get married with the believing one, okay? It's the word of God. I have seen many people who marry to Gentiles, unbelieving people. Well, they you know, promise, you know, I'll go to church. But once they got married, they don't come to church. They rather stop their spouse from coming to church. And their spouses eventually didn't come to church. So God tells us to meet and marry God-believing people. But, but there is no relationship inside the church happening. So how can I find the God-believing one? Trust me, that kind of, that sort of question. So I said, so young people, listen to me carefully, okay? A church is a place where you pray and worship God. It is a holy temple of God. Inside the church, you should not make any relationship. God tells not even talk with the you know, worldly words. So what should we do? Do it outside. Inside the church, don't do it in a fleshly sense. Don't say, I love you. Don't do such a thing. But you can do it outside the church. Because you're going to marry him. In a good manner. Have a pure relationship. Before you get married, don't give in your flesh. Don't ask for it, and don't give in. Make it pure and clean. After you got married, don't have Good, you know, make love. After you got married, you got to have this kind of love in, a, in spirit. If you have in a fleshly love, it will eventually change. And just as God said, just you know, get married and make, uh, you know, make love together. How good is it? I explain like this. It cannot be tolerated inside the church. If you, you know, make a relationship inside the church, then there will be no order inside the church. It's just not like another world. But it is the Word of God. If it happens inside the Word of God, then it will spread. Well, someone did it, and I can do that too. What will happen inside the church? you got to live only for the kingdom of God and His righteousness. A church should be like that. But that fleshly thing happens, it cannot be tolerated. The church must be holy. So if you have a relationship, 
You gotta see whether it is uh, in a going out with the relationship, and don't give in your flesh. Don't ask for it. With pure love, with pure spiritual love, lo you know, have a relationship and get married. How how good is it? So it is to teach the children of God not to dwell in sin any longer and get out of the darkness and to live in the truth. It is to lead even one more soul to heaven. If it is not the will of God or if it is a sin before God and if it, if it leads to death, the church must firmly, flatly point it out and teach them to turn back. It does not mean that you point out individuals and admonish them from the pulpit. Pastors, should not point someone and hurt him from this altar. This altar is not a place for such a thing. It is a place where the word of God is preached and taught. Have you ever seen me mention a name of a person? I do. If he is worth to hear praises, but have you ever heard me mention a name of anyone who committed sin and left this church? I've never done that. Not even the name of those who left this church after 1998 and 1999 incident. From this holy altar, no pastor should point and hurt a member. The member will get hurt and he will turn his back to the shepherd. Since God is the only judge, we must give advice and encourage them with a heart of mercy and love according to the word of God. And we got to lead them to the truth. May all of you become a church and a congregation to be guided in the will of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Let's receive senior pastor's prayer for the sick on screen. Lay your hand on the sick part of your body. If you are not sick, lay your hand on your chest and receive this prayer for the desires of your heart. Hallelujah, Almighty Father God of love. Please, lay your hands on those who are receiving this prayer now. By transcending space and time, Show your works to your children who are receiving this prayer on the internet and through GCN in branch churches and local sanctuaries around the world. Give them the faith to believe and drive away all their negative thoughts and doubts and drive away their tests and trials. From head to toe, all entrails, joints, nerves, tissues and cells, whatever the sick part may be, burn them with the fire of the Holy Spirit and with the original light. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs and viruses and infirmities, go away, may the light come. Scorch all the terminal and incurable diseases with the fire of the Holy Spirit and drive away all endemic diseases such as malaria. All contagious diseases such as cold, flu and fever, go away. Protect them from all kinds of germs and viruses. Heal them of stomach, lung, liver, breast, uterine, intestinal, and all other cancers. AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high and low blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid, heart, lung, and women's diseases, and all inflammations be cleansed and go away. Heal them of polio, stroke, arthritis, and herniated discs. Back pain, headache, neuralgia, and all other pains go away. Epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and other mental diseases go away. All kinds of paralysis be loosened. You get up, walk, and leap. Let the eyes see well. Let the ears hear well. Let the blind come to see, the deaf come to hear, and mute come to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents and fix their broken bones. Let the heat and burning sensation go away. Restore them from burns. Let there be no burning skull left. All kinds of drug addictions, poisoning, and substance abuse go away. 
let the dead nerves, tissues, and cells be regenerated and bring the dead back to life. Give them the blessing of conception. May you receive the blessing of conception. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan and the ruler of the air, go away. And their servants also go away. Go away, you evil, unclean, false, and deceitful spirits, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen the bonds of wickedness. Darkness, you go away. May the light come. Father God, give them strength to cry out in prayer, to cast off sins, and to be sanctified. As their spirit and soul prosper, let all things go well with them, and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters, and bless them to lead a prosperous life without any problems. With the firewall of the Holy Spirit, with the heavenly hosts and angels, and with your blazing eyes, protect all your children, their family, their workplace, and their business. Give our students wisdom and understanding, and give them fervent passion to study hard. Keep their hearts and minds from the worldly things, and bless our students to love our Father God all the more fervently. Whether your children eat, drink, or whatever they may do, let them do it all for the glory of Father God. I met God. I experienced God. I received answers and blessings from Father God. Bless them to say like this with their lips. Father God, thank you. Be glorified alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. それは命与える救いの